next up is Margaret, Margaret Karembu, who is from the International Service for the Acquisition of Agri-Biotech. Margaret's a passionate advocate for the power of science to transform agriculture in Africa. She is many things. She has a very long CV. She manages the ISAAA program. She's written several books and co-written books and is a fantastic science communicator and campaigner. So I'm delighted that she's here to talk and she's going to talk about regulatory and communications landscape, which way for Africa. Thank you very much, Fio. It's late in the afternoon. I hope we are all awake. Are we? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to first appreciate the organizers for inviting me to this meeting. I read about the prairies in my geography of uh, high school. I never knew I would ever step into the prairies themselves. I also want to thank our vice chair of the board, Professor Jennifer Thompson, for inviting and really getting us involved. So uh, this afternoon, I'm going to share some perspectives on, it's on? Okay, I'm going to share some perspectives on uh, Africa's uh, regulatory and communication landscape as relates to agricultural biotechnology and just drawing some lessons on what we can do or we can learn as we get into the newer emerging technologies, the new breeding techniques, the drones and so on. So this is uh, one of the reasons for us to just press on. It's about this, uh, the African woman. This is the story of Maria Swele. She is from South Africa, who grows BT cotton. And Maria, like many of her colleagues who have adopted agribiotech, has a story, and it's a successful story. And this story inspires us to move on, even when the technology adoption is getting um, uh, slow in Africa. This is her story. BT Cotton Enterprise has been rewarding, enabling me to purchase two tractors, a car, and a house. I have also managed to pay my younger sister's education. Attending to our crops is so much easier and has drastically reduced labor. We no longer need to carry crude tools to weed and spray, as most of this is now done mechanically. So this is the story of African women who have been able to access technology. How has agribiotech impacted women in Africa? As you know, majority of farmers in Africa are women and they do most of the work. Beatrice alluded to this in the morning that during the times of tendering for the crops, there is so much cooperation in the house, in the family, because the women will do the spraying, they'll do the weeding, they'll do the picking, but maybe when it comes to the marketing, that's a different story. But one of the things that technology has been able to do is to save time and labor for women who have to weed and spray with children on their backs. It has also been able to protect them from harmful chemicals, including their children. As you can see, some of these ladies, they have to go uh, carrying their children in the farms. Better quality environment as a, as a result of reduction of the chemicals, healthier foods, and most importantly, technology enables women to acquire more skills and release time to grow more food for the family. That's the beauty of making farming more efficient in Africa and making it even more smart for the African woman. But then, when you look at the regulatory terrain for GM crops in Africa, it tells a different story. We have huge opportunity costs because very few crops have been commercialized. We have only three crops that have been commercialized, and these are in two countries now, South Africa and Sudan, and then two point, about 2.8 million hectares against a global acreage of 185 million hectares. This means that Africa is losing seriously. When it comes to those countries that have at least initiated some work, some research on uh, biotechnology, agribiotech, especially crop biotech, we have about 13. Out of these, four of them, South Africa, Sudan, Burkina Faso, and Egypt, once grew biotech crops, but currently we only have two. The circled Burkina Faso and Egypt, 
discontinued growing the crops out of very many factors, but none of them was out as a result of the technology. So my talk today is just to give you some overview of the landscape as far as the regulatory system is concerned. Going back to history, where have African countries adopted or started off developing their regulations on agribiotech? It's the question of which came first, the chicken or the egg? And when it comes to regulations, a lot of countries have developed regulations in abstract, out of, in the absence of products. So it's a bit, a lot of imaginations on how the crops would behave or would look like. We also know that the major driver has been the, the protocol, the International Protocol on Biosafety, the Katagina Protocol, and it has tended to emphasize more on the precautionary approach, more of risks than of benefits. Again, in Africa, we have what we call the Africa Model Law. This was something that, just as the name sounds, it's supposed to be a, it was supposed to be a model to help countries develop their own regulatory uh, systems, but unfortunately, there were countries, because of the individuals who spearheaded that law, uh, adopted a, an extreme interpretation of this precautionary principle, leading to many of the regulatory uh, frameworks in Africa being very stringent uh, with a lot of liability and redress clauses. So when you look at a degree of functionality of uh, the regulatory systems in Africa, it's more of twists and turns. If you look at uh, the white is, you know, when you are starting, the yellow is when you are start trying to get to, towards testing the regulatory system, and then green is when you actually make it functional to grow your crops. There are some countries that have been able to move from zero to commercialization, very few. There are some who are struggling at the experimental stage, and there are others who go up and down. Sometimes they go up, they are about to commercialize, and then they go down. Uh, Sylvester was just here telling us about how an approval for the Wema maize was done, but due to some circumstances, for example, in Kenya, a study that came out sometime in 2012 uh, imposed a ban on uh, GM imports, but that has also been uh, pushed into affecting research. So basically, this is the kind of, uh, you know, the, the process of developing the regulations is long, tedious, sometimes very painful, especially for researchers who want to deliver products to farmers. There are many extraneous variables, but one key one that keeps coming, and Anne Glover knows that because I've discussed it with her many times, is the European factor the organic, the agroecology, you know, Africa, what does Africa need? And everybody out there seem to know what Africa needs without asking Africans themselves. And I challenged uh, Morris yesterday that uh, we need to have these talks, conversations in Africa, because we want people to appreciate the kind of situations and the kind of environments that we operate in. Then there has also been an emergence of what we call alternative facts. I'm sure you are very some of you are familiar with that. And it is adding regulatory burden to our scientists, to our, to, our, to our regulators. And unfortunately, it has penetrated in Africa now. And viewing or trying to portray Africa as the victim and those who want to get the technology in Africa as the villains. But at the same time, ignoring the fact that Africa has come of age, there is adequate capacity to develop and regulate this technology in Africa. That is one of the me my messages today. Now, when it comes to some of the general observations, what has worked, what has not worked, or what, is, what would be one of the best practices? One of the major challenges has been the deeply held perceptions about private sector. You recall the first products, GM products, came from the private sector. And they, there has been a lot of suspicion, a lot of mistrust on what exactly they, they want. And uh, I keep uh, talking with my friend, my brother here, Sylvester, about that because there has been those perceptions. And any time you mention a certain company, people already start uh, labeling you as either pro or against and so on. So we have ended up having regulations that do more of police aim, police, as in police, 
instead of facilitating or policy. Then what, what, what has worked is when several governments uh, are able to revise their stringent and workable regulations, and then we, when we have more public sector uh, support to develop products, that works very well. That would work against those perceptions of, of the private sector. Then one other uh, challenge that the regulatory systems have had in Africa is the, ash, the issue of activism. A lot of activism in Africa, as I said, everybody knows what Africa needs except Africans themselves. That is what it seems. And we, we seem to be more being reactive as communicators, as scientists, instead of being uh, uh, proactive. So we need to secure government commitment and political goodwill. This cannot be overemphasized. We need to intensify communication, especially effective communication that gets people on the ground to talk about these technologies. Uh, then again, when you look at the regulations, we said earlier, developing regulations in abstract without products in mind. And here we need government leadership. And those governments in Africa that have provided that leadership have been able to commercialize crops for their farmers. And we also need one as a best practice to consider these regulations on a case by case based on country priorities, not based on <laughs> Europe's priorities and ideologies. I say that because um, and with a lot of uh, respect for the many uh, EU scientists who have been supporting and many partners who have been working with us. But when you talk to our politicians, there has always been that fear that, you know, we trade with Europe. Europe does not accept. That's the, the connotation. Europe does not accept this technology. And yet, when you provide the evidence that every country in the world is taking up this technology based on their own priorities, if it's in the pharmaceuticals, Europe is number one. But getting that message to our policymakers has been quite difficult. And then, of course, the issue of the highly precautionary approach, despite the 22 years of safe use of the technology, meaning there have been high compliance costs and over-regulation, even before you get to the ground. So we need to continue sharing data. We need to also support implementation of harmonized uh, Efforts like COMESA, the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa, which has been working on a regional approach to biotechnology and biosafety. Then we come to the communication landscape. How has that been? Now, it is Mark Twain, one of the famous American writers of the 1910s. Actually, he lived between 1835 and 1910. He said that a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. But we know today 